Independence of the second line. Most financial services firms have a three lines of defense model. Departments backing up the second line usually include compliance, legal, risk, and finance. Each department must have a formal status within an organization and its duties and responsibilities must be clearly specified. The second line must be fully independent from the business line and have the authority to act. They must not operate in silos and must collaborate to defend the organization. While they must have a good working relationship with the line of business and the first line of defense, they must be empowered to investigate real or potential breaches of laws or regulations and have access to senior management and the board of directors where necessary. So I guess they're trying to say here that the second line, you know, they, they might, you know, they, don't, they should do their own research because the first line of defense, which is like the onboarding, transaction monitoring, financial crime, you know, they may miss stuff. And, they could, it could be too easy just to go, oh, yeah, this is good, you know, so let's just sort of tick this. In order to identify and mitigate risk to an organization, it is important that the three lines of defense have a good working relationship. To ensure their independence, the roles and responsibilities of the second line to defense functions must be clearly documented. These documents should contain measures that can be tested to ensure independence. Allocation of duties must be clearly defined to avoid conflict of responsibilities, particularly in smaller companies. The second line of defense departments must be empowered to obtain access to information throughout the organization in order for it to carry out its responsibilities. Staff and other departments must be aware of their duty to cooperate with the second line, have a right to conduct investigations of possible breaches of company policies, laws, or regulations. They must be permitted to appoint outside experts to perform investigations when appropriate. Be able to freely express and disclose their findings to senior management and, if necessary, the board of directors or a committee of the board. They should also make regular reports to the board. Reporting lines must be clear and free from conflicts of interest. The compensation of second line teams should be detached from business profitability to maintain independence. SAR, STR overview. Okay, so they're going to talk about the difference between a suspicious activity report and a suspicious transaction report, which is probably more related towards uh, transaction monitoring. Uh, the following are reports that law enforcement um, or to potential instances of money laundering or terrorism financing. SARs are made by financial institutions and other professionals such as solicitors, accountants and estate agents. They are a vital source of intelligence and that, that would otherwise not be visible to law enforcement. SARs intelligence and instrumental in locating criminals. Some SARs provide immediate opportunities to stop crime and arrest offenders. Others help uncover potential criminality that needs to be investigated while others provide intelligence that is, that is useful. Regulations obtained, require, sorry, regulations oblige legal entities such as financial institutions and designated non-financial businesses and professionals to report suspicious activity, uh, but many of them don't. Uh, these requirements vary in jurisdictions, for example, uh, FinCEN in the USA and the NCA in the UK provide guidance documents on their websites to aid the completion and filing of, S of suspicious activity report forms. An organization reports suspicious activity in a, a SAR. The, report, the reporting requirement is to be risk-based, is risk based, taking into consideration the organization's business model and the risk presented by its customer base and its products and services. Even if a transaction has not occurred, a SAR might be required. For example, if someone changes their mind when sending a payment if compliance checks are raised, this behavior changing their mind will need to be reported. Information provided through SAR, such as contact details, aliases, identities, investment activity, bank accounts, and other assets can lead to investigate instigation of new investigations or enhance ongoing operations. SARS can help identify changes in the nature or prevalence of types of organized crime, such as mortgage and boiler room frauds, which you don't really see much these days. This enables detection and prevention, uh, prevention activity, including the issue of, uh, of alerts to businesses at risk from such activity. Regulations related to SAR STR. The regulations for filing a suspicious activity report or a suspicious transaction report vary by institution and jurisdiction, but there are common regulations throughout that, that call for investigators to follow timelines and limit information access. A SAR filing must be timely and effective as soon as the alert is generated. The investigation can start. Once the activity is deemed suspicious, the reporting timeline begins, and the SAR must be filed within the timeline set by the regulator. The information included in the SAR does not need to be not need to demonstrate the occurrence of illegal activity, but it does need to demonstrate the reason for identifying the activity as suspicious. A SAR should not be shared outside the financial institution and required 
uh, required law enforcement agencies as this could compromise the investigation even within the financial institution so should be handled with care and even within so with care and not should have access no one not everyone should have access to that information